Hi, I'm Phil Craig. And I'm Andrew Loney. And together we aim to bring you the most scandalous stories and some of the most scandalous people in history. So thanks for joining us here on the Scandal Mongers podcast. Hi, Andrew. How are you? I'm very well. It's been an exciting week, hasn't it? Things are beginning to take off. It's been a really, I think it's quite a special week, actually, in the history of our podcast. Um, um, so we are actually going to talk about some um, cool stuff about Andrew's upcoming book on Andrew and Fergie, but perhaps we should do a little review first. What do you say? I think that's a good idea. I think it's, I think, 12,000 views of in four days of the Valentine Low, uh, yeah. picked up by the New York Post uh, and mm-hmm. other 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 organisations. Um uh, so we're back on the news agenda, which we were to start with, but at least now we've got the subscribers behind it. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, thank you to everybody who's been watching and listening, and especially those of you who listened to our repeated pleas and subscribed on YouTube, because we passed the 1,000 barrier that we've been going on about just before the last episode. And that seemed to make a real difference. Um, people seem to find the show more easily. Um, a lot of people popping up in the comments saying, um, I've got a few friends of me, in fact, I love reading these out. Uh, Catherine Positano, you guys just popped onto my feed. This is great stuff. Just subscribed. Cheers. And then another person, Michelle Ford, answers, yes, isn't this great? It popped up for me too. Also just subscribed. Greetings from Oz. And then uh, Carolyn Ford. I don't know where she's from. Hello, Carolyn, if you're still with us. Ditto me. Just subscribed too. So this is really very uh, lovely for us. And it actually makes makes up for some of the abuse that we got for the Boris Johnson programme. Yeah, well, people actually have very strong feelings on that and didn't feel that we were giving um, the, the speaker a hard enough time. But well, I think what's also nice is people are making suggestions of things they'd like to hear, which we're listening to. And in fact, we've incorporated, I think, one of our future talks is something that was suggested. It, it was. I'm going to just go back to Boris, though, because uh, it did produce some absolute classics. My favourite was Infantile Sarcastic Schoolboys, um, which is better than the man who said we had a... Uh, 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 corduroy trousers and nose hair, so he thinks we're a child. Pathetic bunch of lefties. They really don't know us. Um, and one very eloquent, simple review, bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, we hardly did any talking in that episode. So um, uh, it's, uh, it's in some ways, people have their own views. And it's very hard to change them. And one of the purposes of this is to try and open up people's minds to other points of views. Uh, uh, and um, But sometimes you can't do that. Well, I think that's actually important. And, and to be honest, the Boris program did produce, I think, my favourite review ever, perhaps for anything I've ever made, even in my career in television. Well, oh, yeah, so you're on your gravestone. Madeline Johnson. Hello, Madeline, if you're listening, from, uh, from America, uh, New Hampshire, I think. She said, I'm pleasantly disappointed. I'd expected something salacious, but I love the tone and the humanity. Maybe it's not a big sell, but fairness and interest in deep analysis is a great brand. Well, I mean, that's it, isn't it? Yes, it's absolutely. Fantastic. Yes, I mean, there is this sort of tension because in some ways the title, our, 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 our strap line, suggests that we're just going to do salacious stuff. But we do pick controversial subjects, but try and do them in a in a slightly more sophisticated and balanced way uh, and bring in people who really know what they're talking about. That's right. And which is just... not always true about royal biography. That's very true. Um, well, you apply, the, you, you apply a historian's rigour to royal subjects, but for those who might have found us through royal stories, we've done loads. I mean, you should look back at the uh, at the ones we've done. We have a really interesting range, and we're going to continue with with with, with a big range of subjects. In fact, we're uh, look, I think is it next week or the week after we're looking at the origins of COVID. Uh, that's controversial. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think again, you know, the, the the views on that have changed, and the whole story was sort of suppressed for a long time. People were discounted if they suggested it was a lab leak. And now I think more and more people are coming around to 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 that being a possibility rather than the wet market. Okay, so for the rest of this show, I'm going to interview you about your exciting new book project. And maybe you'll give our listeners and our viewers a sneak peek at what you've been finding out about Princess, uh, Princess, Prince Andrew um, and his life um, and his yep. relationships. Well, this is the first time I've gone public on my research. Um 
So I'm giving you all sorts of material that uh, no one else has, has heard. It's actually a joint biography of the Duke and Duchess of York. It's the third of a trilogy of books I've done on royal marriages. So the first was the Mountbatten's, the next was on the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. Uh, and it's really fascinating. One of the big questions, I think, is, you know, how, why is this couple still so close? They describe themselves as the happiest divorced couple in the world. And is that true? And, and if that's the case, will they get married? Why do they ever get divorced? So that's one of the central elements of it. But also, there hasn't really been a proper book on either of them. And though they're less important figures uh, now, in, 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 um, they are fascinating psychologically for a biographer. Uh, and of course, they're in the news. I mean, we've just had the story of, of, of the Duchess's um, mastectomy and, and um, her eight hours of, of uh, hospital uh, operations. And the, there's a rumbling story of what happens to Prince Andrew after all these Epstein disclosures. Will he be thrown out of Royal Lodge? What's the relationship like with Charles? So there's some very interesting things going on. And of course, very interesting parallels with both his his great nephew, Harry, and his great uncle, the Duke of Windsor. I mean, like Windsor, he has this love of golf. He hasn't got a great deal of ambition, great sense of public service. Uh, and like Harry, he is the spare. He was second in line to the throne at one point, and has been clearly pushed down the line as more and more people <coughs> came on the scene, got born. And I think it's very difficult, unless you've got a lot of drive and a lot of things that you really want to do in life, um, to lose that position. And particularly when you've been brought up, he was the Queen's favourite son. He was indulged, spoilt, no boundaries there. And as a result, uh, and also not very intelligent and self-aware, as a result of that, he's been allowed to behave very, very badly. And it's, of course, it reflects on, on the monarchy. Oh, I'm a great well, monarchist. That's a, a pretty monarchy. impressive, pretty impressive intro. Um, I want to go back to the beginning because I mean, I think the first I really um, thought or focused on Andrew was was the Falklands War. When he's in, what was he in his early twenties? Yeah, well, exactly. He just just graduated from Dartmouth, and you know that I agree, and that's part of um, in a sense the, the the trajectory of this book. How did this blue eyed boy who was the hero of the Falklands become this this her hermit who's completely despised? But actually, it's true. It's true. There was, he was a hero. I mean, he actually put his life on the line. He was serving in a, a, a flying helicopters uh, during a well, conflict in which many helicopters were shot down or crashed. Um, missiles were well, flying around. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I, I can go. I'll go into this in more detail when the book comes out. But actually, they couldn't. I mean, the Queen was adamant that, of course, he should go and serve. But I talked to people he served with, and he was never really placed in, in great danger. The story oh, really? of him being a decoy for the exocets. Uh, I mean, you know, clearly anyone flying in those conditions in helicopters during wartime uh, was at risk. But for example, he was never allowed to fly missions to the island until it surrendered. Uh, there were code words used for which helicopters should be used on missions, and he wasn't always sent on the most dangerous. Uh, he was doing a lot of um, anti-submarine uh, work. So it was a lot of it was, you know, going out looking for things, and, but a lot of it was just ferrying, you know, supplies from ship to ship. So, I mean, this is all part of the spin that's presented. You know, he was good looking. Uh, he was very sort of charming. Uh, we had this great reputation of Randy Andy. There he comes back from the Falklands with the rose between his mouth. But actually, the truth is that he is a, a carpet and slippers man. Um, he, he likes to watch the golf and uh, and videos and uh, have an early night. So, again, this, this picture as presented is not really so the reality. So the next thing that I remember, and I'm sure that's true for a lot of people, is this wonderful woman, Koo Stark. This would have been in his prime Randy Andy phase of his life. And, of course, in those days, that phrase was meant as a kind of almost like a compliment, like a, a blokey, jokey compliment. It seems a lot more sinister now, given what we know happened with Epstein. But, yeah, yes. he, he has this high-profile relationship with Koo Stark, which is the first That's time he probably rather... gets criticised in the media, I think. Yeah, it's a rather sad story because I think they were very compatible. She was good for him. She was uh, four years older. She was... Um, more mature. He had a very sort of childish sense of humor. He laughed his own jokes. Uh, he loved food fights, you know, <laughs> all the worst elements of a sort of public schoolboy. And, and she sort of tamed him. And I think it was a genuine love affair, but it was discovered that she'd acted, uh, in some sort of, um, erotic films. And clearly they couldn't have the 
Duchess of York uh, with that sort of reputation. And so the palace basically, particularly Prince Philip, basically banned him from from marrying her. Uh, and I think he married um, Fergie on the rebound from that. So that's she was the truth, is it? It, it, was, it was the fact that she'd been in what I gather was very innocuous, soft core 1970s erotic films. And that, that was yeah, well, funny, I, I saw the film. I watched the cinema at the time, and um, I used to pop in for the good bits. Um, I saw the tickets <laughs> outside. But, um, you know, and everyone says it's just that one film, but actually she made four or five films. It wasn't a sort of, you know, the, she, her argument is she was tricked into doing it and she had to, to, to follow the contract. But, in fact, she'd done this three or four times before. Um and she came from a pretty damaged background. She she really didn't know her father till she was 14. And suddenly her mother sent her across to Britain from New York to live with her father, who was a film producer called Wilbur Stark. Um, when she appeared in these films, she was nicknamed by the tabloid Starkers. That was became her new uh, thing. And she went on to, to marry very, very quickly again after that relationship broke up. But it is, you know, I suppose what one forgets with all these stories is there's a lot of sort of... Um, the, the, the human beings that we're dealing with, and 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 these things carry on. But the great thing about Andrew is he 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 gets he keeps in touch and and stays friendly with all these girlfriends, and he's godfather to her daughter, um, and that reflects, I think, well on him. And I had a lot of people say very very good things about him, particularly ex girlfriends. So this image of this this buffoon, this boisterous sort of man's man, isn't actually again the the, the truth. There's a sensitive side to him, and. And as with Matt Batten, it's very complex, very contradictory, and and can at one moment be playing the, the 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 very imperious, you know, I'm I'm a prince card, and the next he can be extremely modest and 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 self-deprecating, and that's what again makes him so fascinating as a subject. Um, Fergie is slightly different. I mean, I think again, damaged background, mother was a bolter, left her. Uh, and in some ways has been trying to to make up for this and be a people pleaser ever since. And this is why she gets into her financial problems. She's always buying gifts for people. She wants to buy their affection. She's very extravagant in the way she lives. Uh, and in some ways, the theme of, of, of this book isn't so much sex, it's, it's finance. It, that's what got them both into trouble. Uh, and when you come to Epstein, I, I don't think the relationship with Epstein is about sleeping with young girls. It's about Epstein paying uh, Fergie's bills. <coughs> Gosh, well, that's that's very new to me. But let's let's go forward a bit more slowly because we're always rushing ahead. Yeah, I find this stuff really interesting because you know Fergie was so popular, wasn't she? When when they married, it was just a couple of years after Charles and Diana's marriage, but it was it was seen as a, as a breath of fresh air, quite informal. She was funny. She was um, very very popular and, until suddenly the story started appearing in the tabloid newspapers about arguments and affairs but there was probably what five or six years where they were actually really perhaps the most popular roles in the in the country if not the world well i mean they, they got married in 1986 i think funnily enough the, the public perception changed quite quickly but you're right she was seen as very natural you know diana was quite stiff and clearly there was a big age gap between charles and diana there was wasn't fergie was was only a few months older than andrew uh she was seen as a woman who had her own career she'd had boyfriends that she'd lived with <coughs> she was a sign of the uh, 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 of, of the change she was very popular particularly with the queen and remained popular with the queen in spite of everything because she liked dogs and horses and i think both she, the, the queen tended to like dogs and horses better than anything else um and uh, it, it was sad, you know, suddenly the press felt that she was a little undignified for this position. She would, um, you know, was, she was, she put on weight. Uh, she, she, she got pregnant reasonably quickly. Uh, and the, the tide turned, people turned against her and found her sort of thought she was a bit vulgar. Um, and it, it's interesting. Diana became the blue-eyed girl. She was slim and elegant. Diana was was sort of like a puppy dog, uh, and so I think that that changed things. She was very lonely. He was away at sea a lot of the time. She was quite assertive uh, against the palace. Diana sort of went a along with the system. Fergie tried to fight it, and to the point where it was said the knives were out for her. She fell out with 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 the palace. Um, 
And so things began to change. She began to get involved with other men, shades again of Edwina Mountbatten. Uh, and Andrew didn't really fight for her. He 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 said once, my priorities are first of all the monarchy, then my job, and then my wife. And so uh, into this vacuum came people like Steve Wyatt, who's a rich Texas businessman, and his friend John Bryan. Um, and they gave her the sort of fun that she wasn't getting at home because poor old Andrew would come back from his even just for the week, a week at, uh, away, and then he'd come back at the weekend. He wanted to, to flop and watch movies and sit on the sofa. She wanted to go out and party. And so there again, there was this disconnect between you the really, two. Of you see, I've had the impression, probably from watching comedies and satires and reading Private Eye, that he was a party boy, that he, he was the one saying, let's go to a nightclub. But you're saying, actually, no, he was, he was actually a little bit boring, a little bit sort of. Sitting at home well, at this time, yes, he was very domesticated. I mean, later he has a sort of midlife crisis. He comes out of the Navy in 2000 and he goes from more or less from the Navy to China Whites, the nightclub, and spends his whole time there trying to pick up girls. Uh -huh. um, but so there is an element of this later on. But at that time, um, he was, a, 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 you know, a, a devoted um, father, I would say. I'm not sure he was the most brilliant husband. So there were faults on both sides, and and she hints uh, at him having affairs during this period as well. Um, difficult for him; he's on he was on a ship most of the time, uh, but you know clearly there weren't good things there. And then, of course, these photographs emerge first of all of her on holiday with Steve Wyatt, and then with John Bryan, uh, the famous paparazzi shots in the south of France. With the toe sucking, uh, it, it, the most the, the thing that Brian got most upset about was he said it wasn't toe sucking; I was licking her toes. Um, <laughs> there's a distinction. So, um, but that of course, at that point, Philip, uh, who'd never really liked Fergie, said, "Look, you're bringing the monarchy into disrepute, and you guys need to divorce." Uh, and so they separated, but they didn't actually divorce. That was Philip's direct command. Which, which that was very much his his line. And and Andrew fell for it. And again, you know, there were, and of course, the big problem there was that Fergie knew a lot of the secrets. Uh, and so they needed to keep her sweet. And the problem there was that they didn't really, she didn't get the sort of divorce payoff that, that Diana got. And so um, she was constantly looking to make money. Uh, and, you know, very bravely, she went and did all sorts of odd things like promote Weight Watchers in the state and Waterford Crystal. But again, it, 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 it didn't do much for the image of the monarchy. Um, and so that wasn't very well handled. We talked last week about, you know, how Meghan might have been handled a little bit better by the courtiers. But here, you know, here we are, same old problems, people being pretty intransigent and not perhaps being a bit more pragmatic in the way they re responded to the problems. You also mentioned last week, I was very intrigued, that um, Andrew's role, uh, I'm guessing this is after he leaves the Navy, um, merges into the world of intelligence gathering, which I something I'd never even thought about before. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, he 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 was involved in the Navy in uh, uh, he was involved in special forces flight. So he would fly people in particularly in the Caribbean doing drugs, drugs runs and also in, in South America. Uh, there's a there's a wonderful story you mean of stopping having... drugs runs, not actually selling, them. <laughs> not encouraging them. <laughs> <laughs> there are people on the internet who think the royal family do sell drugs, so maybe they're right. I don't know. <laughs> no, I haven't found that. Okay. But there's a wonderful story of of uh, I was told of him uh, that he's bringing a group of, of I think maybe from an exercise a group of special forces troops and they fly over Sandringham. Uh, and he says to them, "Would you fancy a cup of? Do you fancy a cup of tea?" And they said yes. So he lands in Sandringham. They all pop their their machine guns in the umbrella stand and pop in and have tea with the Queen. Uh, and um, so the, 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 there's some nice sort of touches there. But yes, I mean, I think he had an intelligence role. When he leaves, has a desk job in the Navy. He's involved with defence sales. So there's a site intelligence role there. And then, of course, this brings him into his time as the trade envoy, uh, which is very controversial. But uh, um, and of course he's meeting all sorts of dodgy people. But actually, some of these people he's meeting at the behest of the Foreign Office, and they're using these back channels, particularly with places like Libya, to conduct negotiations. I mean, he's a front for for um, what's going on behind the scenes. There are intelligence people actually on uh, in his party. Uh, so there's often a sort of explanation for things that are happening. 
So again, with with some of the the, the the Epstein allegations, when you look at them, for example, there's a man called Peter Nygar who had an estate in the Bahamas that he's pictured with, and the suggestion is that the two of them were on the prowl together. In fact, he 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 popped in one morning with his kids to look at Nygaard's estate. That was it. But Nygaard, of course sent out pictures and people have jumped to conclusions. So a lot of the book is about actually getting rid of a lot of these myths. Um, uh, and again, on Epstein, uh, we look at Virginia Jeffrey's testimony. It, a lot of it doesn't uh, stand up. Uh, uh, she's changed her story several times. You know, the evidence that we've got at the moment is, is a, a picture of him with his hand around a girl and her claiming she came was trafficked to him in London. Um, and the, the, everyone says, well, he settled with her and therefore he must be guilty. He didn't co uh, cooperate with the, with the FBI and others. But, you know, again, if you look at it, if he had cooperated, you know, there may have been all sorts of problems down the line. He was advised by his lawyers not to do that. He could still be innocent. Uh, and again, with this girl, you put your arm around a girl doesn't mean you slept with her. So I think, you know, for me, I'm still, the jury's out on a lot of these. Um, oh, that uh, is a surprise. I mean, uh, it's just so accepted, I think. In, exactly. People, in, people, people jumped to conclusions. Into that he was guilty. And I mean, he clearly was extremely foolish to get involved with a man like Epstein. Uh, you say the attraction might have been financial rather than sexual, but Epstein was known for a long time as somebody who could arrange sex parties effectively and some of the women at those parties were really young possibly illegally young so he was pretty stupid wasn't he yes he's very naive uh, uh and he's very loyal as he said he's you know been brought up in a bubble with all the people around him telling him how wonderful he is uh, uh and that he can do no wrong and he basically doesn't listen to advice and so you know all a lot of the decisions he's made which have been terrible including going on newsnight are, are decisions that he made against the advice of others uh and um uh, yes, I mean, I think clearly, you know, here was someone who was introducing him to lots of interesting people, useful people, people who could make him money. Uh, I mean, Epstein was on some of these trips as a, as this, this, these these trade delegations, which was quite wrong. Uh, That's uh, so. And, That's so. Uh, yeah, and others. But of course, one of the problems I've got is that the government will not release the list of people who are on these trips. Uh, and uh, one of the challenges of this book is a lot of people are not talking. Uh, and the documents are all closed or destroyed. Uh, and so I keep going round and round circles, asking sort of basic questions like correspondence for some of these trips, who was on the trip, what were his demands? Um, I mean, famously, he, he had a whole series of demands and brought his own ironing board to, to on these trips because only his valet knew how to, 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 to iron his trousers. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, clearly Epstein was providing girls for lots of people, probably for, for uh, Andrew. I've seen no evidence that Andrew had a predilection for very young girls. I mean, he did have a, he did seem to not get much beyond the sort of 20 year olds at a time, but he's had lots of relationships with, with even older women. So, um, that never quite rang true to me. But I think it was, as you said, that he gave, in a Newsnight interview, he gave him access to people um, that he found useful. And Epstein famously is supposed to pay about £15,000 of Fergie's debts. I think it was a great deal more than that. Oh, that um, really but I think the real story here isn't Epstein. It's it's the way that both Fergie and Andrew have used their royal positions to make money themselves. Uh, and... Um, I, would, I can't go, I have to be careful what I say, but, you know, he clearly used his trade envoy role to, 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 um, help others who were not necessarily, were not championing British industry. And she has, um, famously been caught in a, in a journalistic sting offering access to Andrew for 500,000 pounds. Uh, there are a lot of people who she acts as a brand ambassador for, but when you approach them and say, what does she actually do for you? They put the phone down on you or say, you know, that's the end of the correspondence. So there are a lot of, there was a famous story recently with uh, people who gave them large sums of money, which was put through the children's bank accounts, which they said was just a sort of wedding present, you know, 200,000 pounds from people who hardly knew them. So there are a lot of very unexplained questions, and they're not answering those questions. Uh, and I think this is the problem that, you know, that I'm a great believer in the monarchy, but the monarchy has to be 
first of all, above the law, it has to be about public service. And it's not about enriching yourself uh, through your position. Well, uh, people who are new to the podcast may not know about your um, long running work on Mountbatten. Um, well, we've done programs on it and the frustrations and the battles you've had to get access to documents. Um, so it does sound like you're treading a familiar, difficult path with this book. Do you think you'll get there? Yes. And I, you know, I have got a lot of stuff. I mean, I've still got to write it up, but I've got a lot of material, new material. But it is frustrating with the documents. You know, for example, I asked for a file on Andrew's parachute parachute training, which was a weekend in 1978, and that's been denied on the grounds of health and safety, law enforcement and national security. Uh, and again, trying to get any information about these trade envoy uh, roles that he had, you know, which are now over 20 years old, those documents should be in the National Archives and are not. Uh, people are alive, so one's got the problems of libel and uh, confidentiality, privacy, uh, and data protection. So in the past, I've relied on documents to tell the story. Here, I'm having to rely on people talking. And, you know, people who, who the, those who really know the story are, are the ones who are least likely to talk. So it has been a challenge. It's taken me longer than I thought. But I think we will have a lot of new insights into the couple uh, after the, you know, as, as a result of the book. It also sounds like a very different way of looking at Epstein that the relationship he had with powerful people was sometimes about sex, sometimes about money, sometimes about access, perhaps access to high-profile deals that um, attracted the interest of intelligence services. I mean, that's, to me, quite a new angle. Um, yes, uh, absolutely. And I think a lot of people, you know, who are now distancing themselves, Peter Mandelson and others, um, you know, uh, found that he was a very useful person to know. Um, so the sex was there. It was where I think there were cameras everywhere. People were being blackmailed. What's interesting is a lot of those uh, those cameras disappeared. The film was disappeared. No one knows what's happened to it. Uh, Epstein himself had connections with intelligence, uh, and there's some suggestion that this was some sort of um, sort of kit, uh, salon kitty that, that that they were using these people collecting information back to Kinkora, the boys' home in Belfast. It was used as a way of collecting intelligence. So I think it, it, there's a there's a much bigger story there, and of course we have to remember that that Andrew was a very convenient scapegoat. He, he they knew he probably couldn't go into court to defend himself, um, and therefore they they focused on him. And there are other all sorts of other people who went on those Lolita flights, uh, international statesmen who have managed to keep out, out of the radar. And he's been he's deflected the story from from I would say more important figures. So he's the fall guy, uh, and the, you know because he is stupid and um, un self aware and in this position, he he he's 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 been caught in the crossfire. Um, you know things are beginning to emerge now, particularly about relationships with some of the banks um, and some of the people there. So I think the Epstein story has a long way to run. But you know it's very clear that that both Fergie and Andrew were using Buckingham Palace uh, as a way of 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 uh, courting all sorts of people, not in the interests of the country, but in their own self interest, and that clearly is wrong and needs to be called out. Wow. Well, as somebody who calls himself a monarchist, you're very good at putting the knife into actual royals. I have to say. <laughs> Well, I think the great thing about the monarchy is, you know, there are lots of people, the King, Prince William uh, and Kate, uh, Camilla, who do a really, really good job. And they are let down by these black sheep who basically take advantage of their position. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's in all and we're paying for these people. We're paying huge sums of security, including still for Andrew. Um, you know, we were paying for his daughters on their year out, uh, traveling around the world, you know, with two detectives flying out first class and, 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 and following them in and out of nightclubs in South America. You know, that's not a good use of, of public money when there isn't really a threat to them. So, you know, I think as we move into a new reign and perhaps they need to look at how they're going to, to operate in the future, um, these, it's important that these people who let the side down, I mean, none of the others do, Princess Anne, Prince Edward, don't have these scandals around them. Uh, it's just these two particular people, and they keep repeating the same mistakes. They go on television and absolve themselves and say, I'm sorry, um, 
the fact is they were caught out and 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 certainly when they're caught out they seem to say well i got it wrong but they come back and do it exactly the same shortly afterwards gosh i mean the thing i guess that surprised me the most in what you've said is you you've expressed a bit of skepticism about the the claims of victoria um gilfrey am i pronouncing her name correctly virginia gilfrey yeah sorry virginia gilfrey um that you know the fact that he paid her most people i would perhaps be one of those people would say well he must have done it you know there is the photograph but you're saying potentially there is only the photograph and her word and it was never really tested in court against his exactly and i think there's a lot of stuff that that um there have been nda signed by lots of people that's one of the problems again trying to get anything um her lawyers claim there was a lot more material that they could that would come out in court but i mean that could just be bravado you know a man is innocent until he's found guilty and at the moment we we have him clearly see see epstein's um house um uh, and we have this photo but but as i say putting your hand around a girl um and being photographed does not mean that you've necessarily slept with her so i think what a lot of a lot of it is jumping to conclusions you know, even if the, the, the photograph is genuine, which I believe it is, that that's also been been challenged. Um, it, it, it doesn't mean anything. Um, so, I think we need to go back to first principles and all these things and look at them. Um, you know, it, it, he's an easy target because you know he can be very pompous and and he's clearly very unpopular. But it's a sort of group think and it's a sort of gang mentality. You know, he's an easy target. Let's all go for him when it may not be the truth. Um, uh, you know, I think certainly talking to people, there's there's a much more uh, kind and sensitive person underneath this. And, you know, to... to well, that's interesting, because you've not held back just in this conversation, criticising him and her, but you're, you're obviously trying to see the man in full, and that goes back to that nice review we had. It is good to do that. It's not always easy, but it's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very easy just to jump on, 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 on and have a line. And that sort of is a little bit what the press do. You know, he is now the black sheep and, and you know, he can do no no right. I mean, the question is, is an interesting one. If you're doing reputation management, how do you bring him back into the fold? What does he need well, to do? That's my next question. Is, is Can he come back into the fold, do you think? Well, I think there's hope for all sinners um, uh, and all people whose reputations have been trashed. But it's difficult. I mean, you've got to have the character and the willpower to do it. And I think the problem is he, you know, he believes he's a prince. I mean, he's, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's the, almost a divine right to rule. And so it's, I, it's going to be very difficult seeing him working in food banks and going off to work in Africa with charities, which is sort of what he would need to do. So I think what they're doing at the moment is, is, is the only thing they can do, which is to keep him out of public view. You know, he's in his 60s. He just plays golf, sits at home, watches TV, sees his friends, does a bit of business on the side. He's popular in the Middle East, um, where clearly being a royal really helps. And that was, of course, one of the reasons he was given this job. Um, and, you know, he did some good things as a trade envoy. He worked hard uh, and there were a lot of places he got to that no one else could have got to. So I think we need to give him credit for all that. Uh uh, that you know the, the picture is a more nuanced picture than's been presented well i'm sure your agent is absolutely furious maybe you are your own agent <laughs> about you giving away all of these nuggets for nothing. No, there's lots more to come lots more to come but nothing i would only a, do it for you phil no one else but a podcast with a couple of thousand i just viewers. wait for the new york post to pick up for, with some of these things well i think you said it you said quite a lot today that they might well pick up on um it's really really interesting uh, when is the book going to come out? I'm going to write it. For well, that. I haven't written it. I haven't sold it, but I'm hoping next year. Um, but I need to get get cracking. But as I say, I keep finding new stuff. It's it's you know it, doing a joint biography. Clearly, you need to do twice as much work, uh, and it's it's a very difficult book. You need to build on people, build on their trust, talk to you, and I think they've. To, to get the stories and it's very easy just to run the, the cuts uh which has been, been presented but the cuts don't necessarily tell the real story uh, and of course getting these documents if i can get them takes a long time uh, i'm not very hopeful but i've got in fact some cases now going through to the tribunals where i'm challenging um some of the decisions even by the ico because i think it is important that that he you know he didn't have a he was there as a public servant particularly as a trade envoy and we're entitled to know who he took with him and um, what went on.
who he saw. I mean, there's sort of example stories that he wouldn't stay with the in the embassy. He wanted to be in in a hotel because there was less scrutiny of what he did. Um, so I, I think we we need to have a, a little bit more light shone on what he was doing. Um, uh, so I think this, it's going to take time, but I hope it'll be worth it in the end. Well, you mentioned the Middle East. I mean, there is a long and dark and often obs- obscured by, well, what's the word? Um, effectively by censorship coverage of arms sales from Britain and France and America to the Middle East, because generally speaking, bribes have been paid. And and though people don't want to know about that, and they say, well, it's just the way that, that it works out there. But, um, we well, don't exactly. know, and maybe I mean, Andrew was involved in that. In fact, he, he probably was, wasn't he? Yes, he was. He was. And in fact, one of the files I'm trying to get is 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 Saudi gifts to the royal family, um, because there's also the separate issue of the, the the private gifts that are given to people. There was a, a room that they had at, at at Sunning Hill, which was the house that the Queen gave them when they got married, called Aladdin's Cave, which is just filled with all these gifts. You know, we haven't touched, of course, on the scandal of Sunning Hill, which was. Uh, sold way above the, the, its value. It was valued at about six million pounds to be basically abandoned. Uh, and uh, a Kazakhstan businessman bought it for, I think, 14 million pounds and then pulled it down. So why did he pay way over the asking price for something? Um, was this sort of money laundering? Uh, you know, again, questions have not really been answered on that. So there's a lot of money sloshing around, which can't be explained. Um, there was money being lent to him by um, uh, two businessmen called uh, uh, who ran a bank called the Bank Haviland, David Rowland and Jonathan Rowland. And there have been a lot of investigations into the relationship they have with Prince Andrew. I mean, they had ringside seats at his daughter's wedding. Uh, there's evidence that they gave him money. Um, some of them, they were on his, his uh, trade envoy trips. So what exactly was going on there? Um, and, you know, the, the, we're not generally a corrupt country, but there, there, there could be a perception that we were corrupt unless people can explain some of these payments. Wow. Well, I think you've given about five front page stories away <laughs> for nothing. And thank you. Wow. That was so interesting. Um, it's a pleasure. Well, to... I think we've got a very exciting sort of series of programs coming up, too. Very, very. Let's talk about them. We've got a couple of minutes left before our cheap, non professional Zoom account times us out. Although I think it's good discipline, personally. I think 40 um, minutes is good, yes. Yeah. 40, 45 is probably what we should be aiming for. Um, yes, we've got the COVID story coming up, uh, which I think is going to be fascinating, the origins of COVID. What is the real evidence that it could have been a leak in a laboratory? And also that people maybe at the highest levels of government in Europe and America perhaps heard those stories and then didn't want them circulated at the beginning of the pandemic. Exactly. No, I mean, the intelligence briefings seem to suggest that. And again, you know, what's happened to some of the scientists who spoke out in China and elsewhere? And why didn't people who 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 knew say something? Uh, we've got something on the Mitfords, and I think we've, you've got a story about a cot death scandal in Australia. Yes, well, uh, we've done several Australian stories. I used to live and work there and got some good mates and contacts. Um, so we're going to be talking to my friend um, who worked on an expose um, uh, on... Um, Quentin McDermott is called. He's worked on an expose of this woman, uh, Kathleen Folger, I think I'm mispronouncing her name, who was in prison for a long time um, over the term for, for supposedly killing her children. And um, the, the evidence that was used had been, according to Quentin, very discredited a long time ago in other countries. And it's taken a long time for her to get out, but she got out about a month ago. So that's an incredibly interesting story that we'll be doing soon as well. Yeah, yes, I, mean, I like this this strand of these miscarriages of justice, and if we can do anything to 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 help, I mean, look at these cases again. I think Absolutely. that's very important. Absolutely. Um, and I think the fascinating thing we discovered is our, our our listeners are pretty much evenly spread. About a third in Australia, a third in Britain, and a third in in Canada. Uh, sorry, Australia, America, and, and Britain, and then a little bit more in Canada. Yeah, we get quite a few Irish listeners and viewers too, and so in Europe. It's actually now we're past the 1,000 subscriber limit on YouTube. We get some more adverts, and they say from the adverts, you can tell the people they think are watching. So this morning it was book your cruise holiday and plan your retirement. Right. <laughs> right. It says okay. about the demographics. 
<laughs> right. So if we get if we get something for Pampers, we'll know that it's young young parents. Indeed. Well, let's hope we do. Well, thank you for everybody who's listened and watched, who's subscribed, who's found us. Please stay with us. This is going to be um, it's been quite an adventure already, and I'm sure it's only going to get more interesting. Thanks ever so much. Yep. Thanks a lot. We'll be here every Monday, hopefully, for the next. Who knows? As long as people want us. Bye. Exactly. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Scandalmongers podcast. This has been a podcast world production. You can get in contact with our show by emailing team at podcastworld.org, placing Scandalmongers in the heading, or via our social media links within the show's bio. 